Gregory the Thirteenth also saw to the building of a tower on the Palazzo Senatorio on the Campidoglio, which earlier that century had been redesigned by Michelangelo. It may seem strange that the papacy was getting involved in this way with the very symbol of Rome's communal life. I'd say that the system of uh, shared governance over the city of Rome really worked only in practice, not in theory. Uh, but certainly, Gregory the Thirteenth helped crystallize the relationship of city and papacy, and it was well established and relatively well running by the 17th century. And stranger still, this statue of Gregory the Thirteenth originally was in the Senate House. It's been since moved to the uh, very nearby church on the Campidoglio of Santa Maria in Araceli, particularly notable, uh, a particularly notable feature of this uh, statue is the dragon, the Bon Compagnon dragon, at the feet of the Pope, which really looks like a domesticated dog. And in the year 1580, Pope Gregory XIII started the construction of the Palazzo del Quirinale. We've seen that at first it was meant to be a villa, but eventually it became the usual residence of the popes in Rome. Gregory XIII also took considerable efforts to enlarge what was really one of Rome's main ports, and a port that's going to be of immense importance as we proceed in this course, the port of Civitavecchia. And this enhancement of the port facilities was meant to allow pilgrims, especially from France and from Spain, uh, easier access to Rome by sea. Unfortunately, I don't have an example of the medal that Pope Gregory XIII struck to commemorate his enhancement of the port of Civitavecchia, but I do have pretty much every other Pope of the 16th and 17th uh, century, an example of their commemorative medals. It was a very important for any number of reasons. Uh, Civitavecchia had its course of military importance. It was important for uh, pilgrimage. It was important for trade, for Rome's food supply. But also, I suspect that the Pope saw the artistic opportunities that representations of the port of Civitavecchia uh, brought in the medalist's medium here is a medal of uh, uh, Julius II on the foundation of the Forte Michelangelo at Civitavecchia. And this is a throwback medal, so to speak, a restitutional uh, medal that really dates to the 17th century. But you can see the uh, Della Rovere uh, uh, fortifications more clearly here with ships in the harbor. But it was the opportunity to present a bird's eye view of the harbor of Civitavecchia that really appealed to popes and their medalists. This is uh, Pius IV, a medal of 1561. Uh, Clement VIII uh, at the very beginning of the 17th century in 1604. Here's a medal of Pope Urban VIII Barberini from 1629, which trumpets his uh, military improvements to the port of Civitavecchia. The Latin legend on the reverse is uh, triumphalist, nunc re perfecto. Now it's done. Now the job is done. Well, it wasn't quite done. Alexander VII Kiji in two medals, one of the year 1659, another of the year 1660, commemorated his uh, improvements to the naval fortifications of the harbor. And then shortly afterward, in the year 1676, Clement X Altieri trumpeted his improvements to the mole, the militarily fortified mole that lie at the entrance to the harbor. The Latin legend, Cultis patet ingressus, an entrance is open to all. A little more than a quarter century later, Clement XI, Clement XI Albani highlighted his contributions to the decorative and aesthetic elements of the port of Civitavecchia. Finally, Clement XIII, in a medal of 1761, underlined his contributions to the uh, economic significance of uh, the port of Civitavecchia for the ease of importing merchandise. And also in 1764, the improvements he made to the urbanistic layout of uh, Civitavecchia itself. For the city of Rome itself, we've seen how Pope Gregory XIII tried to move forward the slowly progressing construction of the Basilica of New St. Peter's, and how Gregory XIII built the magnificent Gregorian Chapel in the northeast corner of that basilica. It's not really a chapel, but it's really a, a part of the transept. 
It was the first complete interior section to be completed of uh, New St. Peter's. And as we've seen, Gregory XIII's intervention here had a decisive effect. His decision to have mosaics rather than frescoes really had an influence on the overall decoration of St. Peter's as it was to come. But in general, all this gave new impulse to the construction of St. Peter's. The Capella Gregoriana, the Gregorian chapel, is technically dedicated to a Greek saint, St. Gregory Nazianzus. And this St. Gregory was a 4th century Archbishop of Constantinople and a theologian, but also the outstanding rhetor in Greek of his age. In the year 1580, Pope Gregory XIII staged an elaborate ceremony of translation, moving the body of St. Gregory, marked by this massive religious festival and this procession that accompanied the transfer of the saint's remains from this church, the Church of Santa Maria in Campo Marzo, he had been buried there since the early 13th century, to the altar of the new Gregorian chapel in St. Peter's. The monks of this former church were compensated. Uh, they were given an arm of the saint and also a huge sum of money. And the Pope's son Giacomo Boncapani featured prominently in this religious procession amongst many religious figures and civic leaders of Rome. In the year 1580, Pope Gregory XIII commissioned the artist Ignazio Dante to complete this massive work for the Vatican, a new gallery of maps. This was an enormous series of frescoes that showed Italy's cities in detail, complete with their harbors. Here are the arms of Pope Gregory XIII, and below them that of Urban VIII Barberini. As we'll see, he was very interested in piggybacking on predecessors' accomplishments. Here is uh, Ignazio Dante's depiction of Italy, then the world as a whole, uh, but here is the New World. You can see some haziness about South America and also the western part of North America in particular. Here's an extremely interesting view of the Vatican complex. The St. Peter's Basilica depicted here has not yet been fully elongated into its Latin cross shape, the Latin cross shape that it would take under Carlo Maderno. The obelisk, however, that originally was positioned on the southern side of uh, Old St. Peter's, has been moved to the piazza that lie in front of the basilica. You will see a great view of the Spina, a neighborhood, a closely packed neighborhood that lie between St. Peter's Basilica and Castle San Angelo that was finally removed, as we'll see, in the 20th century. And there's Castle San Angelo itself. Then looking across the Tiber, one sees the northern end of the Campus Martius, in particular the Piazza del Popolo with its famed church of Santa Maria del Popolo, also the obelisk at the center of the piazza, and also one can see the Villa Medici and much else beside. A view of Florence with its Duomo prominently placed at the center in Ignazio Dante's maps and the city of Venice. There's much more to explore, but this is just a glimpse. I want to say one more note about building in Rome. It was the pontificate of Gregory XIII that saw the building of the Jesu, which was consecrated in 1584 specifically as the mother church of the Jesuit order. I want to talk about the Jesuits in a moment as we turn now to the specific policies of Gregory XIII. Above all, Gregory was committed to reform of the church. More precisely, he was committed to following upon his predecessor, Pope Pius V, in putting into practice the recommendations of the Council of Trent. For instance, when it came to bishops and cardinals, he made sure that they took up residence in the sees to which they had been assigned. But also under the rubric of church reform came Gregory XIII's transformation of the nunciatura. Before Gregory, these nunciatura, which can be translated as um, ambassadorships, they were primarily diplomatic agencies, but Gregory envisioned them as instruments of real church reform. He defined in a better way how the nuncios, those are the ambassadors, the papal ambassadors, how they were supposed to act, and he opened new embassies for them in Switzerland and in northern Germany, where Protestantism was strong and Catholicism was in retreat. So with Gregory, we see new nunciatura at places like Luzerne in Switzerland and Graz in Austria and Cologne in Germany. And in each of these cases, it seemed 
absolutely crucial to have direct representation uh, by the Pope in these countries, in these communities. Now, there was much concern after the Council of Trent to have a well-trained clergy for the Catholic Church. And in line with this, Gregory XIII established colleges in Rome, but also other cities at vast expense, and he entrusted them, by and large, to the Jesuits. Now, who were the Jesuits? A Spaniard, Ignatius of Loyola, founded the society. He had been wounded in battle and experienced a religious conversion. In the year 1534, he grouped together six other young men, including Francis Xavier, and they professed together vows of poverty, chastity, later obedience, and there was a special vow of strict obedience to the Pope. Ignatius had a plan for the order's organization, which Pope Paul III Farnese approved in the year 1540 by papal bull. For his part, Gregory XIII significantly increased the privileges of the Society of Jesus, and he founded for them a number of colleges. Needless to say, in the 16th century, particularly after 1517, when Martin Luther broke with the church, there was tremendous open anti-Catholic sentiment in Europe. To battle this, uh, Gregory XIII uh, patronized any number of colleges and seminaries, particularly those in Rome, that were founded for foreign nationals. And these national seminaries were meant to create uh, highly trained priests who would return to their Protestant homelands and bolster the Catholic movement, the Catholic faith. And particularly the German and English colleges, but there are any number of uh, them that basically in the generations to come would uh, make all the difference for the Counter-Reformation movement. Now, it was Gregory XIII who started building an Archigymnasio della Sapienza, an archgymnasium of wisdom, which later became the University of Rome. And also in Rome, right at the outset of his pontificate in the year 1572, Gregory XIII reconstructed and richly endowed the Collegio Romano, the Roman College. This was later named after him the Gregorian University. Gregory's aim here was to inculcate students with the knowledge and the skills that was necessary to guide the church in the post-Trent environment in both theological but also scientific matters. Here's a particularly elaborate medal of the year 1582, which commemorates the reconstruction and reconsolidation of the Collegio Romano. Gregory XIII is kneeling in prayer. His papal tiara is at his knees. Uh, and the figure of Christ appears to Gregory in the clouds and is pointing toward the building of the Collegio Romano. Sheep are grazing in front of it, and the Latin legend says, feed my sheep. Here's the general location of the Collegio Romano. You can see how close the Pantheon is to the west. And we're looking here at the facade as it faces south. This church here to the north is the Church of Sant'Ignazio, and it was constructed essentially as a chapel to the Collegio Romano. We'll be discussing this at great length in a future lecture because it is a Ludovici construction of the 1620s. Here's a late 17th century view of the Collegio Romano. In the background, you can see the rear of the pediment of the Church of Sant'Ignazio. Again, the facade of the Collegio Romano as it appeared to Vasi in the year 1786. And we can peek again at the Church of Sant'Ignazio. And here's a view of the uh, Collegio Romano, uh, but only to the side. We're looking east at a 17th century construction, the Palazzo Pamphili, which is later known as the Palazzo Doria Pamphili, an enormous construction that uh, must be the largest um, palace in the historical center of Rome. It contained 1,000 rooms and it plays a real historical uh, importance. The Collegio Romano as it appears today. And here's the dedicatory inscription of Gregory the Thirteenth for the completed Collegio Romano and he is dedicating the building to religion and also to the liberal arts, the year 1583. Above the placard, one notes the cherubino, the uh, winged cherub. This is a ancillary symbol of Pope Gregory the Thirteenth, which shows up in all sorts of different connections, as we'll soon see. In addition to the Roman college, there were numerous uh, other colleges that Gregory the Thirteenth specifically set up for foreign nationals. There was a German college, the Collegio Germanico, 
There was the Collegio Greco, the Greek College, which can be seen here in the Via del Babuino. And here is a view. Also a Collegio Inglese, an English college, set up in 1579. There was also a Maronite college, an Armenian college, even a Hungarian college. And the Hungarian college we see here in a later incarnation after it had been amalgamated with the German college. Another significant achievement of Gregory XIII was to see to the publication of something that the Council of Trent had stipulated mm, almost a full decade before Gregory himself reached the pontificate. That was for a new and improved edition of the Corpus of Canon, or, or Church Law. Well, Gregory saw to its publication in the year 1582. It was really right up his alley. As we've seen, he, this was the area that he was trained in and also had taught at the university level. Gregory also was following the guidelines of the Council of Trent when he had a committee update the list of forbidden books. He also approved new clergies. One instance was the year 1575 when he approved the Congregation of the Oratory of Philip Neri. We'll return to Philip Neri later in this course. Uh, he was still very much alive. He would die in the year 1595. And he had put together a community of priests without vows but dedicated to prayer and to preaching. 